they see them. The final game of this homestand on Saturday. Here is Broussard centering Ellis. He scores! Two newcomers team up. Ellis is first as a flyer. Makes it 4 nothing Philadelphia. Well, we talked about how vocal Ellis is. You could hear him yelling for the puck from up here. And Broussard took one glance, made an incredibly good pass right on the tape of Ryan Ellis, and he snaps it home. It's Isaiah, just reminding you that FlyersNittyGritty.com and the OMB Podcast are brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. Hey, do you have damage to your home? Not sure who to call? We suggest that you call Summit Public Adjusters before your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be very stressful. Let Summit take the stress out of the claims process. From storm damage to your roof, to toilet overflows, to broken pipes and fires, Summit gets you the most money for your repairs. So next time Mother Nature leaves you in need of repairs, call Summit Public Adjusters at 215-752-0560 or visit summitpublicadjusters.com, licensed in PA and New Jersey. And we are back. It is Isaiah. And welcome to the OMB Podcast, brought to you by FlyersToTheGritty.com and Jim's South Street. And by the way, if you are down on 400 South Street, Jim's Steaks, Fries, Hoagies, 40 years of the best, delicious, and the finest Philadelphia tradition. So check it out. And if you live down there, make sure that use DoorDash if you can't make it over and they'll get that food right to your door. So just remember... Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA. And with that, uh, let's introduce our panel. And uh, good to have everybody back. Uh, last week, it was just me and Kevin. This week, we got with us, starting with Chef to Let B. What's up, guys? Good to be back. Yeah, great to have you back. And of course, as you always. sounds thrilled, Chef. <laughs> uh, another trip to the vet today, but... Well, yeah. You know, but it's all, all good now. It's getting better. So all, right. That's good. all good. Good to hear it. Yeah, it, everybody's, uh, you know, dogs and uh, cats and uh, pets are part of our family. No doubt about it. And, of course, you heard there just from a second ago from the great Dan Silver. Sorry for the interruption, Isaiah. It's uh, it's it's nice. Uh, it's nice watching, like, playoff hockey. How many game sevens have we had over the last oh, few days? Yeah. It's it's uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, there's nothing better than it, but it also makes me a little upset that you know we don't have any kind of rooting interest. But hey, it is what it is. Maybe in 30 years from now, the Flyers will be in a game seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we dust that off? There were five game sevens. It just every everybody probably knows by now that Carolina beat the Boston Bruins, the Lightning beat Toronto, Edmonton beat the Los Angeles Kings, the Rangers defeated Pittsburgh. And Calgary defeated Dallas, and I went seven and one in my bracket, so I still have hopes of you, uh, seven and one. Wow, seven and one. Oh, yeah, but the hairs of my chinny chin chin. Really, I mean, those games. Just, I mean, I really thought Pittsburgh totally outplayed the Rangers. Shesterkin was totally the difference, and Louis Domingue, the the in game six, the, the puck pops off of his glove, and you know, and. Uh, the, yeah, what are you, you going to say? It's just great, great hockey. And and it's uh, off we go. We get to have the Battle of Alberta with Edmonton and Calgary. And then we're going to have the Battle of Florida with the Panthers and the uh, Lightning. And, of course, we're going to have uh, – what else are we going to have there? We're going to have St. Louis and Colorado. And that should be a really good series uh, between a defensive-oriented team that still has some punch and a lot of depth. And Shane Malloy will be taking the note of that one. And, of course, the Rangers will be playing against Carolina Hurricanes 
you know, you got a guy like Shesterkin rounding in the form. They definitely have a puncher's chance. Yep. Enjoy the hockey tonight. Tonight off. Good time for a podcast. We have to get into the Philadelphia Flyers. And uh, last time you guys didn't really have a chance to weigh in about any final postseason thoughts. And Chef, I'm going to get to you first. Just a brief synopsis of what your overall thoughts were and maybe uh, a thought about uh, what you're hoping for coming up in the off season. Well, I'm, what I'm, I'll start with what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for a real viable turnaround. I'm looking for people to make decisions, not because of fan favorites, but because what is practical to the team moving forward. I don't, I don't want to hear that, you know, you're attached to Konecki or Provorov or, or other players just because you think they could be better. Like, like we, we've dealt with that for the last two, three years now. So I think it's time to make a rational uh, decision, informed decision, I should say. And, and let's see what, if we can turn something around and give us something to hope for. The best part about what we dealt with at the end of the season is we were seeing some younger, new, different players. And at least that was something to look forward to. I granted, like you said, the eye test was a little hard because it's sort of like September baseball, but it's the same, but at the same token, you can gauge something and you can get something. And uh, those kids to all their merits, they played well, they played their hearts out to get that second look come training camp. And well, you know, that that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to see what they do right before the draft leading up to the draft. Cause five isn't bad. Two or three would have been better. One would have been great, but you know, uh, I still think they can get somebody a consequence there. So we'll see what happens the day before the draft, the hours before the draft, the draft itself and training camp to come free agency. Yeah, well, there's a lot to a lot of ground to cover there, and we'll we'll definitely be uh, leaning into that as we get closer to the draft. Dan, yeah, it's uh, you know I guess the head coaching search is sort of four on the list now. <clears throat> we saw the Islanders hired their coach already, and it just feels like I don't know. It, it just feels like we're moving at a glacial pace, and I understand that you got to wait. You know, maybe you got to wait until the off season's over to. To, to finalize what you're going to be doing and see what coaches are available. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. It's just such a sense of frustration with this team. And then as Chef said, you see the devils vault over them in the lottery, which is more frustration. So it's, 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 it's tough to, uh, to muster up any kind of interest or optimism in these guys at the moment. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I, like the thing I don't understand, Dan, is like how did the Flyers finishing fourth overall have a greater chance of getting the number five pick? I, I to this day, I, I haven't heard a, a rational explanation. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, it's it's. I'm going to have to take a bone to pick with you. I'm a gambler and a poker player, and it's just it's math, man. If you, if you think about what the lottery is, I mean, Montreal had a much higher chance of picking third than they did of picking first. If if you're going to have a lot, it's just math. If you're going to have a lottery where teams from s- two through 10 or two through 11 all have a chance of moving up, then starting with one, those teams are going to have a higher chance of moving down than they are of staying where they are. Because Mon- Montreal had a 20% chance of getting the first pick, right? So. Okay. If Montreal ended up at two, would you have said the same thing? I don't understand how Montreal has a better chance of picking second than first. It's the same concept, right? Montreal's okay. chances of picking first were 20%. They had an 80% chance of moving down. I mean, it's it's not that. It's just math. I mean, if either people I, want a lottery or they don't want a lottery. I guess there's a way to slant it. I, I, I know it's math and all that. No, I'm not a gambler. At, and I haven't gamble since like maybe playing pools like remember the old football pools like 30 40 years ago <laughs> i mean that's how i'm just not a gambler because i don't like to lose i like to win i don't like to gamble but anyway <laughs> so let me just so let me so i just pulled up the, the math just because this was this yeah. was actually a pet peeve of mine on twitter was people were saying the same thing as you and i'm not yeah. trying to pick on you no, but not so montreal had a 25 percent chance of picking first an 18 percent chance of picking second and a 56 percent chance of picking third 
Arizona, 13% chance of picking first. They were in the number two slot, but they only had a 14% chance of picking two and 30% of three and 40% of four, right? The whole, the way that it works is that if you're going to have a chance of teams behind you moving up, then your chances, the, the, the closer to yeah. number one you are, the higher the chances you're going to move back. So for the Flyers, it was 44% chance of picking fifth, um, which was moving down a slot, right? You have to literally, you have to go to number, Ottawa was number seven. That's the first pick where the team actually had the highest chance of staying where they were. Ottawa was 44% to stay at seven and 36% to move back. Right. And that's because that's sort of number seven, sort of like the threshold where the teams behind you don't have as good of a chance to move ahead of you as you kind of do to stay where you are to move up. But like Newt, Newt, um, Chicago, who was in the sixth spot, they had a 34 percent chance of picking six and they had a greater chance of moving down to 41. So it's just it's math and how you want it to, to work out. No, that's okay. Now, it's good to have an explanation. I don't know if anybody's taking the time to really think about it. It just seems unfair. So it's based on emotion. You're taking the emotion out of it. Cor- and I like that. Yeah. Correct. It's like, well, you know, I'm a poker player and I know, you know, I, I know that uh, if if I put all my money in and I'm a 96% favorite, you know, 4% of the time I'm going to lose and it's going to seem very unfair, but you know, I'm, I'm with the the percentages are with me, but, but it doesn't always happen that way, you know? No, no. That, that, that's, uh, now, Isaiah, that's you touched on it briefly, question. and I might be jumping the shark because Dan brought it up too, the coaching search. Or, am I jumping too far ahead by asking and, Yeah, I just, want to, I, I just wanted to – because last show we didn't get a chance to talk about mm-hmm. Sam Moran. Okay. And I, 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 you can talk about – I just wanted to pay homage to Sam. Uh, I didn't think he was much of a player – but if the Flyers had like three quarters of his heart, yeah, the Flyers players, they wouldn't be having a sixty-one point season. Just in my opinion, well, what what do you have to say as we before we move along to uh, the coaching and all that? I I that kid has got he he's like what well, he'll probably go down as like the Rudy Rudiger of like Flyers hockey, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, he, you know, I don't know how much he probably had a lot more talent than that kid did, but. I mean, he, he hung in there. He hung in there, and I can respect that. It's 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 some something for anybody to go out there, and I think I think that's why it's that that grit, that mentality of the at least you always go out there and you try your hardest. Or and, and well, it used to be it used to mean that I should say, and now I I think that might have been tailed to the wayside. But I I just think that he's the kind of he's the kind of heart that you want in your player, and if you could get that on at least half this team, uh, they'd be in the playoffs right now, just based on the, you know, outstretching your ability because teams have been known to do that. Well, yeah. Uh, and if, if somebody, in case somebody missed it, Sam Moran has been forced to retire. Well, because of a series of knee injuries and it's just not going to work out for him and the organization uh, plans to uh, give him an opportunity in another capacity. And we'll see how that works out. And uh, All the best to, to Sam Moran. Yeah, just really- one other thing. Uh, yeah. No, real quick on Moran. He just seems yeah. like such a hardworking guy and a and a great teammate. And it really is a shame um, is. Sort of what's happened to him. I always go back and wonder, you know, there was the training camp where Haig, Sandheim, and Moran were all rookies. And two of them were going to make the team. And everyone thought Sandheim was going to be the first guy to make the team. Of course, Robert Haig was the first guy to make the team because Dave Haxtell was infatuated with him. And I guess Hextall too. And then Sanheim, you know, ended up being the second guy to make the team. And Moran got sent down and he got injured right after that down with the AHL. And now I'm guessing that, you know, he's probably the injuries to his knees probably were going to happen regardless, I would think, um, because it just seems like he's an injury prone guy. But I do wonder sometimes like, hey, if this if these guys had made the decision to keep Moran up instead of Haig, maybe he never would have had that injury. Maybe things would have been different for him. But um, probably, you know, probably not a useful way of of looking at it and thinking about it. But but the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, my heart goes out to, to Sam Moran. Hopefully he finds um, something good to do after playing hockey. And like you said, maybe he'll get a, a nice job with the Flyers and make a difference. Yeah. I mean, the odds were stacked against him. Yeah. Okay. That, that fell flat. Um, 
All right. So, Dan, Ivan Fedotov signs, and the Flyers kind of knew something and had a picture of him signing his contract. It's pretty clear they're going to shepherd him out of Russia somehow, some way, or he's already out. And he's going to compete for a backup spot next year, perhaps with Felix Sandstrom, who remains unsigned, perhaps not. I think he'll probably need some time in the AHL, but just general impressions about a guy who's been laying in the woods for for a long time. This is a huge signing for the Flyers was bringing Ivan Fedotov over. Just his background, the Flyers drafted him way back in 2015. Seven years ago, the Flyers drafted him in the seventh round as just a project goaltender. He's 6'8", and we know how long it could take goaltenders to develop. Well, for big goaltenders, I mean, it takes them even longer to develop. He's 6'8", 200 pounds. He'd always been kind of decent over in Russia, uh, but the, the last few years, he has been nothing short of sensational um, over in the KHL for Russia. And this year in the playoffs, he was unbelievable. I, he had a 937 save percentage and went 16 and six. I think his team won the championship or lost in the championship. Um, the CSK Moskva team. He's basically arguably the best goaltender in the KHL. And when we talk about guys like Shesterkin um, and Sorokov coming over from there and, and being impact players for the Rangers and for the Islanders right away, that's exactly what Fedotov could be. Now, I think he's a little older than those guys when they came over. So his form is probably a little bit more exposed over in, in Russia, but his form is fantastic. So the the upside for this guy is completely unlimited. You might be right, Isaiah, that he's going to have to transition to the North American ranks and he's going to take some time and maybe he'll need some AHL seasoning. But we're talking about a 25-year-old goalie who is arguably the best goalie in the second best league in the world over in Russia. So this is a huge signing for the Flyers. There's a there's a chance that he could be better than Carter Hart. Uh, it's a big deal. And it's something that kind of fans can get a little bit excited about. Excellent. Uh, good to hear that. I mean, the Flyers need some good news. And they're apparently not going to uh, take the salary cap space required to re-sign Martin Jones, who probably got what he wanted out of this year in Philadelphia. Uh, Jeff? Let, let, let's get into the coaching search. Uh, things changed dramatically when Barry Trotz was surprisingly fired uh, by the New York Islanders, who, by the way, announced that Lane Lambert, his assistant, would be replacing him. So that is one spot that's already been filled. And Lou probably had that in mind. But that kind of changes the landscape for the Flyers. Elliot Freeman's out there saying, oh, well, Barry Trotz is you know, you would think that the Flyers would be a team that would back up the Brinks truck to sign him, but there's a lot going on there. And I'd like you guys to maybe go through that, uh, you know, his affiliation in um, the Winnipeg, where he's from. Uh, maybe he if he's taking some time off. You know, this might not happen for the Flyers, and uh, it seems like people are getting their hopes up. So what say you? Well, uh, I I mean, I weighed in like people were talking about the whole Winnipeg connection. And I'm like, well, and then, of course, everything gets when, you, when you're talking about that hometown connection. I don't know a lot of players and, and crossing over several sports that sit there and go, oh, yeah, I want to go home and play for a home team. I, there's not I mean, you would think that they want to do that. But how many times has that come to like? reality I, I can't think like i remember it was a big deal when trout became a free agent they were they were hoping he would come and play for phillies and then you have what other players out there yeah, uh, but is it coaching the same as playing uh, yeah it's but like, you yeah, know different. okay uh, it, it might be it might be different but is the expectation still there of course it is i mean a lot of a lot of people can't take the hometown pressure of coming back to their hometown. Now, I don't know how bad the Winnipeg, Winnipeg media would be for him, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just saying, a lot, you know, there was a lot of back and forth about that. And, you know, I just, I just think he – I don't I don't expect him to come to Philadelphia. I don't think it's the right fit for the team. In my opinion, I think there's more aggressive coaches out there that you would probably need if you want to do that retool. Uh I just I, I don't know. I see him more of like that. That's the hole he's going to fill with Toronto 
I think that I think he would be good in Toronto, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean that that is possible, Dan. There is a discussion that he has intimated that he would also like to be able to get into management or at least have a, you know a say in personnel decisions greater than than most coaches in the NHL. Uh, what, what's your feeling? I mean, I, he'd be to me. He's like the perfect coaching candidate just because we know what he can instill in his teams. I mean, you, you look at how the Islanders have, have played recently this year, notwithstanding, and every complaint that people have about this Flyers team, they're listless. They come out slow. Their defensive systems aren't good. You know, they have trouble getting motivated. Like it seems to me that all, every problem that the flyers have this guy is the one who has has fixed those kinds of things in the past checks every box checks every box and so if he came here and the t- team still stunk then it would be like oh my god what the hell is going on around here you know i almost want to see him come here just just to see that like let's see how good he is can he turn this disaster around if he can like i'm amazing but yeah, I mean, he to me, he's he's the perfect candidate. But again, as Chef said, there's a lot of openings out there. Um, you know, Vegas fired their coach today. I'm sure that'll be a destination that that a lot of head coaches are looking to go to. So it's yeah, I would I would love to bring Barry Trotz in. I think he'd be perfect. But this is also this is going to be a test of you know Dave Scott sat there in that silly press conference with Chuck Fletcher talking about how he. Though Chuck has an open checkbook to do whatever he wants. And of course, that doesn't mean anything with the salary cap and with players because you can only spend up to a certain amount. Chuck may have an open checkbook for players, but it doesn't mean jack squat. However, here's where the open checkbook could come into play because Barry Trotz is going to want a lot of money. And, you know, if it's a, if it's a blank open checkbook, throw everything at Barry Trotz, tell him he can you know, be involved in management too. You know, the Flyers is where executives come to spend the rest of their lives. So, uh, you know, let's promise all that to them. Yeah, they asked Dean Lombardi and Paul Holmgren and Bob Clark. But the yeah. thing that comes to mind for me is um, a Chef with, with Barry Trotz. This is a guy who's going to already like a Hall of Fame level coach. I think he's third all time in wins. And he's done both. He's, he's, he's built teams from the ground up, like in Nashville, but he's also been like a Laviolette or a Tortorella. He's taken teams that just couldn't get to a certain point and elevated them. He did that in Washington. He obviously did that with two finals appearances with the Islanders. And, and the Islanders closed like gangbusters. The complaint apparently was that he was stifling some of their offensive talents and he wasn't, he wasn't doing a good job in development at the pro level with guys like Oliver Wallstrom. And I don't know, I, I think our, you know, lose a, a shrewd guy, but it's, um, it, it's tough. Maybe he just like Lane Lambert enough where he, he didn't want to get, he, he wanted to listen to some of his uh, more offensive players. I don't know. Was there uh, apparently a conflict with him and Barzell about not having, uh, uh, they're not uh, coming to a, I guess disagreement on how the offense should be run or some, and let's, I mean, purportedly, I, I can't, yeah. I can't, I, I don't yeah. know either. I, I mean, like I, I'm only hearing tidbits of stuff. Uh, and, and this is, and part of me saying, don't, don't get me wrong. I want to clarify my first response. I would love to have him as our coach. I just don't think if you're looking for the turnaround that what you think is going to happen in one or two seasons, I don't think – I think that's more – the Flyers are more of a project than anything else, and I don't know if someone of his pedigree – why would you want to get involved in that is what I'm saying. I, I'm saying he's closer to other teams with Winnipeg and Toronto, in my opinion, and that's why I wanted to say what I said. Uh, I, I, it's not that I don't want him. I do. Uh, it's just – I don't. that's why I said it. I don't think it, that's great of a fit. Well, I, I mean, I think – Charlie O'Connor, I think, said it best. That Charlie O'Connor said something to the effect, and you can check him out at The Athletic, in one of his articles that 
The, the only downside with somebody like Trotz, because it's never the wrong answer to hire Barry Trotz. Like Dan said, he checks all the boxes of the problems they've had. And it might even be merged with some, something called a, a team identity, something they haven't had, oh, I don't know, what, a decade? But the, the problem could be is that he gives – he loads the Flyers – into a false sense of security in that they're going to be able to be better than they think they are sooner. And they don't take the intermediate steps that I think they need to make in order to have like that real window of contention instead of just, Hey, let's just get patch up and paper over some things so we can get into the playoffs. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, it makes total sense, and that's kind of like almost what I was thinking too. I didn't read Charlie's article, but I will now. But it, I, and, and that's what I mean. Like you, you could almost see a, a coach getting frustrated coming here and not being able to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, and knowing he's not going to have the tools to do it. I, just, I just don't. I don't think hiring him. And having him putting him in that position and not giving him everything that he needs to get the job done, I don't think that's the best for anybody. Yeah, I mean, I think Charlie referred it to to it as like the being in that mushy middle in, yes. in pursuit of just getting better enough to be in the playoffs and not maybe taking a step back. Like I think they ought to take a step back. And so, I mean, that's that would be the only downside. But there's a lot of work to be done here. There's a lot of a lot of runway here for the Flyers to improve. And I, I don't know if they can really do anything. But I, one thing I've noticed, and Dan, I want to ask your opinion about this, because you, you can be perceptive about this stuff. When Fletcher had his press conference recently, and you didn't get the opportunity to really, you know, on the last show to talk about that, obviously, um, he seems to kind of want to redefine <laughs> what aggressive retool meant from January, from Dave Scott. And it's almost like he was saddled with this aggressive retool crap, as I call it. And he kind of, well, an aggressive retool is this. And we're going to be aggressive in every area. That's an aggressive retool. Was there a divide there? And Chuck Fletcher is trying to bridge that gap because he really maybe doesn't feel that way himself. That was a, that was a goofy press conference, that last press conference with Chuck Fletcher. I was, I was watching it and... I had two thoughts that went through my mind. The first one was this man looks defeated. Like he looked defeated to me. He looked like he just rolled in off the street after like a bender all night long. Like he, he looked tired. He didn't look good to me in that press conference. That was just my take. And people are welcome to go watch it on the Flyers website and and see what they think too. But he looked like a tired, defeated man. And then my other thought was, okay, well, he wasn't saying anything of substance, I don't think, during that press conference. And so my other thought was, okay, well, maybe he's just, he, you know, he's realized that he just can't be honest anymore in these press conferences. And he just needs to kind of say things uh, so that people don't, you know, know what he's saying. I mean, I think the whole Giroux thing, like, it, it seems to me that maybe they were a little too honest uh, about what was going on with that. Maybe they couldn't let it get out, but he he basically he painted himself into a corner there uh, and and wasn't able to get a very good package for Drew. And maybe he's just like, you know what? I'm just not even going to say anything publicly, nothing concrete. I'm just going to do my thing. But those are my two takeaways from that press conference was he, he just looked defeated. And then I was like, well, maybe he's just doing this and not really saying much because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't think he, he should put anything out there publicly anymore. But those are my takeaways from this press conference. I don't know what you guys thought. I mean, to me, it wasn't quite to the degree, but it was almost to, I mean, kind of like halfway towards AV's press conference prior to this, you know, at the end of last year. Kind of like not really, you know, one foot in, one foot out. I it could could be. Yeah, I remember that press conference with AV. I mean, he you're right. He looked defeated. He didn't want to talk about the players. I mean, he looked like he didn't give a anymore and that's kind of what chuck that's kind of what chuck fletcher looked like in this conference now do i think that chuck fletcher doesn't give a shit anymore no absolutely not like i think he wants to turn this a team around with every you know moral of his being i don't think the same was true for vigno i think vigno had sort of checked out a little bit i i don't, I don't think fletcher has checked out i don't think it's in fletcher's dna to check out 
but I do think he looks he looks a little defeated to me. Yep. Yeah, Chef. I think you got a lot of information without getting any information. I think it was just a lot of talking. It, it didn't really. I couldn't tell which way where anything went. Uh, it, it was it kind of let me flat and confused. Well, he wants to to have a similar off season to 2019. And then he wants to hire the right coach. He was supposedly at that juncture going to take five or six weeks to do that. And then try to get on the market. I'm sure that altered things. Uh, trust that the incoming prospects will solve the team's depth issues, get Couturier and Ellis back. Well, that's, you know, that's get, get out the rosary beads on that one. And then bank uh, on players like Hart, Konecki, Sanheim, Farabee taking another step forward and hope that the uh, developmental process will improve and the scouting process will improve because of some of the money they spent on guys like Alan McCauley and the analytics people and, and, and hiring Danny Briere full time. And that's, um, you know, I, I, I guess it, this is a part of the show where I ask, and Dan, I'll start with you. What is the path forward that you think is not necessarily the one that you think they're going to take? Well, if you're, see, I think that Dave Scott and everyone on down, with some exceptions, should be fired. I think. That's that's where I'm at right now. I mean, and one of the things, and I didn't get a chance to put it in the today's notes, is a Colin Newby at the Hockey Writers, and I, you might have seen this too, but he talked about how the Flyers were almost like where Edmonton was, like about five years ago, when Edmonton, I think it was Cates is their owner, Daryl Cates, and he was talking about, I don't know if it was him or one of the executives, was talking about how there's something in the water. And, and it, almost like, this under Dave Scott and, and, and filtering through the entire organization with notable exceptions like Sean Couturier and Scott Lawton were like, well, you know, the injuries really were a big deal, not to use as an excuse, but here we are using it as an excuse. I know there's, there's a sense of like, like you said, Chuck Fletcher seemed defeated and the organization seems defeated. And I want that entire element as like a malignant growth. And I just want it. I want it out. I, I want I want that whole mindset taken out. So to ask you again, what what would you do as opposed to what you think they they're going to do? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I I I think that that's still that mindset is still comes more from the players and maybe you know based on how they're playing, sort of results in a guy like Fletcher feeling totally defeated. If, if I was running things, I mean, it would be a full on rebuild. I mean, I would, I would not trade JVR. Um, I would, because you're going to have to give away assets to, to get someone to take him on. I would hold on to him and hope that I could trade him at the next year's trade deadline for a third round pick or something. You know, that's, that's obviously a small component of it, but that's just an example of something that I would not do. Cause to me, if they move JVR this off season, and pay someone to take him like they did with ghost that's signaling that they do think they can make the playoffs next year and be really good next year. Um, but I would, I would keep him just for the year. I would gear things towards making sure that I'd want to figure out some things about some of the young players next year. Like I'd want to see what I have with Ivan Fedotov. I'd, I would, you know, I would be trying to move some of those big contracts in this offseason if if you can, the long term contracts. Um, but but again, my goal would be towards having a team that that it has a reasonable chance of getting a top two or top three pick next year, because next year's draft is the one that looks like it has a couple of really generational players with uh, Bedard and Mishkov. So that's what I would be doing. I would accept the reality that this team probably can't compete for a playoff spot, much less a cup next year. And I would really hone in on seeing, okay, what are the cancers in the locker room? Like we've heard things about Ivan Provorov. We've heard things about Travis Konechny. We've heard things about numerous different guys on the team. Like, are they a problem in the locker room or not? I don't know. I would want to really figure that out. I mean, they should have already figured that out, but there's so many problems with this team that trying to sort of, wade your way through it and retool aggressively and think that you can have a cup contender next year is just, 
is downright probably silly. So I would just be concentrating on that rebuild and finding the head coach that you think can, can lead you through that. That's what, that's what I would do. I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to answer that question, Isaiah. And I don't know if I kind of hit on what you're looking for, but, but that's what I would do is I would not be trying to aggressively retool. Um, I mean, it's, you, you have to have the overview. You have to have the macro first. Mm-hmm. And then I, I can talk to you about different players that y- you may or may not want to uh, let go of. And you or- already started talking about some of that, Chef. Wow. I agree with a lot of Dan, what Dan said. I, I, I think you're you're crazy if you think, you know, you, you're going to try to give away even more draft picks than what you did already and then still try to retool. I mean. It's it's kind of ridiculous by by thinking you're going to unload JVR on somebody. I think you're kind of stuck with him, and I it, it's fine, it's fine. You got it. The best thing to do is is go into this year knowing that the Flyers fans, judging by season tickets resale, reopting their their expectations are tempered anyway. So why not sit there? And you're going to have – and I'm sad to say because I don't think – the way they're talking and the aggressive retool and all that stuff, I really don't think they're going to have their coach anyway in quotation marks. I think whoever they get is going to be transitional anyway here for uh, two years maybe and until the team gets back to where they think it should be and then they'll go out and get a coach. Uh, uh of but any this, kind this of caliber. Is, I, I'm this, just telling you is, what I'm thinking. You know, yeah, that's as, okay. But this yeah. is probably Chuck Fletcher's last hire. So I would think he might want to swing bigger. Yeah, but you, well, yeah, but uh, you're you're under the impression that he can swing bigger. Uh, I mean, and I'm not saying not by his part. I'm just saying that there's nothing in the history of Dave Scott and, the high, and that crew that's telling me anybody higher than Chuck Fletcher – that he's really going to be allowed to make any kind of key impactful decisions, especially in the last year of his contract. Now, I, I just don't see it happening. I don't know. Say, I'm, I think what needs to be done is what Dan said. That needs to be done. Is that going to be done? I'm not holding my breath. I'm yeah, kind of I'm, a little negative right now about it. Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are because you, you want to hear realism from the uh, from front office and again i repeatedly talk about what the rangers did i was so happy for rangers fans i'm not you know i've someone accused me of being a ranger fan but i said that's how you do it you come out with yeah. a letter you say hey this is what we're doing you know like it's not like a process and sure they, they got a lot of breaks along the way and they, they're geographically desirable but bottom line you got to give them credit they executed yeah. a plan and whenever things went their way they took it to another level and they draft, they got some draft breaks. And it's like, those kids really aren't helping them that much right now anyway. Not like, you know, I wouldn't want uh, Lafreniere or, or, or Kako, don't get me wrong. It's just, it, that's what the Flyers need to do is they need to step back, take a look at what they have. I'd be dying to get rid of contracts. Well, yeah, I agree. Might as well keep JVR. But if yeah. you have the opportunity, to, if Patrice Bergeron, for example, is going to retire, do you want to maybe try and see if, if they'll take the rest of Hayes' contract? It's probably the only place he would wait for. He's got one more year left on that no move. I mean, I've been very open and vocal about not wanting to go through eight years of a no move cl- uh, clause, which begins with uh, this year with Sean Couturier. I mean, you need, when you're a 61 point team and you're kind of capped out and your best player uh, the last year and most of the last decade is not coming back. You got problems, and if yeah. you can't see that, if you think they can across the retool your way out of that, I mean, these people are, like I said on the, the Steel Flyer show, delusional. Oh, you just made me feel better. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I just, hey, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. It just, it, I'm just going by the track record the last couple of years. I was hopeful. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I don't know if if the players are out there or the ability to move stuff around because the team is so maxed out, if the possibility is even there this season, but at least you can get started by moving out players. Like Dan said, that, that might've be issues in the locker room. 
Yeah. And it's and obvious. It I've, it's obvious, you know, that that at least two that he brought up, that you, you, you've heard rumblings before. So uh, I think that's the, that's the smartest approach to do. Start by, you know, uh, cleaning house. And you, you got you got to not be afraid to do it. And that alludes to what I said earlier, too. You, you got to not be afraid to pull punches because you feel comfortable. Yeah, a couple more items. And just, Dan, it's just one brainstorming here, just a, just a little bit. The LA Kings are probably ahead of schedule in in arriving, having gone through a successful retool, unlike the Flyers, which you tried to do for years. They still have Kopitar. Uh, Dowdy should be coming back, still a really good player, and Quick was very effective in the playoffs. But they have some young players that might not be ready to get take advantage of what's left of those careers. And you talk about guys like Konechny and Provorov. And I'm looking at players like uh, Kupari, Turcotte. I mean, Byfield is, is probably a pipe dream. But I'm thinking the Flyers can reshuffle the deck with some of these guys that might be problems and get some talent from a team that needs that elevation with guys that can hit the ground running for another organization. Meanwhile, they went through a really good developmental system in LA. Is that, is that something also you, you could, would take a look at, or is that? Yeah, it's funny because I've got some good friends who are big Kings fans and I was, you know, watching those games and, and looking at the Kings have had one of the best farm systems in the league for the last number of years. And so you're like, Oh, they're playing, you know, they're, they take Edmonton to seven games. There must be some of those young kids who are really contributing and not, not really actually. I mean, Arthur Kaliev is probably the main guy that was like uh, getting a lot of ice time. One of the young guys, but like Quentin Byfield has not developed yet as they've hoped. Um, Gabe Velarde has, has had some back issues, but he's not sort of developed as they've hoped. Kupar has been just okay. Turcotte's been not great. Yeah, the right. last few years, um, you know, where he's been playing, not in the NHL. So a lot of the guys that they've drafted really high are sort of look like they're going to take a little bit of more time. Sean Dursey has been pretty good back on the yep. blue line. But, yeah, it's an interesting concept that, that you mentioned, sort of looking at, at a team like that to make a trade with, maybe with a guy like Konechny. I mean, Konechny to me is the one that's going to be really interesting. Like, I'm not sure they're going to be ready to move a guy like Provorov just because he eats up so many minutes on the blue line. But to me, you know, specifically looking at position, the best way to kind of work from one of their strengths to try and make this team better is, is trading from the wings because they've got a lot of good young wingers who can be up on the team next year. I mean, we saw Noah Cates, we saw Bobby Brink, you know, guys like um, Lazinski, Wade Allison, Owen Tippett, uh, Frost could even move to a wing. Like they've got a lot of good young wings on entry level contracts who I don't think are that much worse. Some of those guys than Konechny at this point and Konechny's making, what's he making? Five and a half million. Yeah. Uh, five, seven, five, something. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, he's making five, five for the next five, three, five, five. for the next three seasons. And so, yeah, he's a guy that I would, and I think he has good value around the league. So that's the one that I'm really interested to see if they end up trading in the off season. Um, and the Kings would be an interesting team to look at because of what you mentioned, you know, they may only have a few years left and it, not sure that guys like Byfield and Velarde and Turcotte are going to develop in time to make an impact during the years that they have left. I mean, Dustin Brown's retiring now, but right. like you said, Kopitar, Dowdy and Quick should still be around. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that would be a team I should look at. I think that if you have Travis connect me on the block, you're going to get a lot of teams that would be interested and then you just have to decide if you're do if you are doing an aggressive retool, then Chuck may not want to trade connect me for a young kid that may not be NHL ready yet. You know, so what they do with a guy like connect me will say a lot in terms of it, what kind of situation we're in. Yeah. That and the coach, uh, although I think, you know, trots having did what he did in Nashville, uh, maybe can kind of, is an all situations kind of coach, but Still, uh, I, I think at this stage of the game, he probably want to be a winner uh, uh, with a winner. Or if he's going to have to do some building, he would like the uh, management uh, possibilities. Uh, but, gents, um, we just wanted to mention also that the Flyers have the possibility of doing 
something I don't think that's ever happened before, and that would be having back-to-back Masterton Trophy Award winners, uh, Chef, because today was announced that the three finalists for that trophy, knowing that Oscar Lindblom won last year, are, but this year it's Kevin Hayes, along with Zidane Chara and Kari Price. So they all have a story. To, I mean, it's, it's minor good news, but it, it's something to talk about. And Kevin Hayes did battle through a lot with the personal issues with the death of his, his older brother and the, you know, having to work through his adhesions, getting several, not several, was that three different procedures on the, on his hip groin area. And, and he played fairly well toward the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, you, you could go to the three finalists and you, you could make a case for every single one of them. I mean, they, they're all really good stories and, and, I commend them all. Uh, I I think it probably going to maybe go with Carey Price. I think he might end up uh, taking it, but that doesn't take away from anything that Hazy went through this year or anything that, you know, anything for Char either. But it just I, – I, I, think, I think it's a great story. I just – it would be a miracle, I guess, if two teams won it back-to-back. I mean – but uh, generally speaking, I, I think each one of them is very deserving of it. Uh, but uh, in, my, in my opinion, I think it possibly goes to Carey Price. Okay. F- fair enough. Uh, oh, well, two other things. Uh, Dan, what to make of today, uh, just getting back to the draft for a second, uh, Grant McCagg, former scout in, in the league, and he runs uh, recruits.ca, about Shane Wright. Maybe not being the first overall pick is is, is that kind of like uh, maybe some propaganda that, that's being put out? But do you, do you think there are some serious doubts? And this is a unique situation where a player uh, might not be all that he's cracked up to be. In fact, I, I saw references he had the same kind of feeling with Nolan Patrick and another player. Uh, what say you? It, I mean, it it seems real to me when you look at. I don't know. It was interesting because I think that when they won the lottery, Grant McCagg was like tweeting out right after that, like, make no mistake, Montreal will be taking Shane Wright. And then now today he's tweeting out all this stuff um, or yesterday, whenever it was that he thinks Shane Wright might actually be a second round talent and that he's been getting destroyed in the playoffs from a, you know, plus minus goals expected type of perspective. I don't know. I haven't, I have not seen enough of Shane Wright, but it does sound like he's been fairly underwhelming this season. And there are a couple prospects that I think their stock has really been on the rise. Um, Slavkovsky, the, yep. the winger for who was who plays in the Czech. Uh, he's been just sensational this year. And Logan Cooley, the Boy. center with the, you know, U S national development team. He's been terrific also. So I don't know. I, I, I'm not in tune enough. I mean, I will say this, that I, um, I message with Grant sometimes on Twitter uh, and I'd asked him a couple of months ago, like, Hey, is Shane right? Like, are there comparisons between Nolan Patrick? And his, his answer was actually that, that maybe p- playing wise, there are some comparisons, but that, but that he, Nolan Patrick had a lot of character and work ethic concerns and Mc, Grant told me that those those aren't similar concerns with Shane Wright. Like people are not concerned about his work ethic. So I don't know. It, it seems like based on what Grant wrote that he has a real chance of slipping. But I I don't know. Maybe you're right. It's propaganda. I'm not sure. But I what's the bottom line is that the Flyers are going to have their choice of pretty decent players at number five, and that. And those players are probably going to fit their biggest organizational needs because right now the biggest needs are right-handed defensemen and center. Right. You know, let's say if Wright goes one, Slavkovsky goes two, um, Logan goes three. goes three, and then probably at four, which I think is Seattle, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think so. They'll probably, you know, I mean, again, who knows who these guys really like, but there's two pretty good right-handed defensemen. Um, who are available, uh, Simon Nemec uh, with the Czech Republic and um, David Jiracek also is a, a Czech or Slovakian defenseman. And they're Is both he, right. He brings more offense. 
Yeah, they're both well. They're 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 right-handed defensemen. They're kind of they're somewhat similar. I mean, I I think that Nemec is sort of like a supercharged version of what we've seen so far from Cam York. He's not as big as Yerchek, and I don't think the he's like as dynamic offensively. But he makes all the really good plays. Um, and Yerchek, who had a a knee injury. He's a guy who just has a, a lot more to me from watching him play Has a lot more offensive upside. He's got a huge shot from the point he plays physically and the flyers are probably one of those two guys will probably bail for their pick. And then there's also kind of like offensive dynamos like Matthew Savoy, Savoy who's, a, yeah. who's a center um, who might have to move to wing, but he's very offensively talented. So, and they may have the, the Flyers may have other guys that they like more than them. You know, I, I don't know who the scouts like for them, but they are going to have a chance to pick a pretty good player. Do I wish that they ended up first or second? Yeah, sure. Right. But, um, but I think that they'll get a good player at five. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So, I think that's all we got for you tonight, folks. Um, we're kind of in that. Uh, early phases of the off season. And as, as stories break, we'll come back and we'll kind of sum it up for you. And if we have some breaking news ourselves, as always, we'll discuss that. So from here on out, we're just going to enjoy the playoffs that we talked about earlier. Uh, fantastic conference semifinals. And my prediction of Florida versus Colorado is still possible. That's, that's, that's all I can tell you about. So chef uh, final words, any final thoughts there? No, I I think it's great. Any time of the year when you look on your phone, your cell phone, and you're in a group chat with your five brothers, and it's like lighting up like 24 messages because they're all talking about how great all the playoff games are, that this is my favorite time of the year. This is when I get to talk to my brothers and really enjoy everything and hockey playoffs. Even though the the fly guys ain't in it, I'm fine with it. I still, I, it's the one time of year I love everything. And uh, if you want to talk about it, my my pool is still good. I'm not as good as seven and one. I think I went six and two. I got. Uh, I was. I was shocked. I one. I was shocked at the with the Oilers. Uh, I guess I shouldn't be shocked, but I, I really thought the Kings were going to come back and win that, but. And then I was surprised at how fast the Predators rolled over. I I, I had that as a six game series, five six game series. I I thought they would put up more of a fight than that. But other than that, uh, you know, uh, it's been exciting hockey. It's been great hockey. I love it. And uh, if you want to talk to me about it, you can find me at Chef B on Twitter. You got it, Dan. Yeah, there's some really good series. I was just checking to see if there's any games tonight, and there's not. So I have to wait till tomorrow night. But yeah. I mean, the Tampa, Florida series and the Edmonton, Calgary series, wow. like those series should both be so exciting and entertaining. And then the Rangers, Carolina series, you've got the storyline of D'Angelo, right? Playing against the Rangers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fun. And St. Louis, Colorado is, should be fun also. Kind of uh, Colorado will be, you know, they still have some questions as far as I'm concerned about if their offensive style is going to, uh, I have same questions I have about the Panthers. Like, how is it going to fare when they face against a really good defensive team who can play physically, and that's what the Blues are. So that's going to be a good series, too. It it's, should be some really good hockey. And, yeah, I'm on Twitter at dsilver88. So folks can can follow me there. And, uh, yeah, it should, should be fun playoffs here. Fantastic. And, yes, you can follow me, Isaiah, I-S-A-I-A-H, underscore 520. Isaiah, don't forget the underscore 520. And, of course, you can follow the OMB Podcast at OMB Puck, at OMB Puck. On Twitter, we have a Facebook page. And, of course, we are on YouTube. Just plug in there, OMB Podcast. And if you could follow us on one of our platforms, give us a five-star rating if we uh, deserve that. We really do appreciate it. It moves us up the charts if you rate and subscribe uh, if for people that are looking for Philadelphia flyer podcasts. And this has been a great season. This is kicks actually kicks off season number six for the OMB uh, podcast. And we really do appreciate your listenership. And with that until next time, everybody take care.